It's tabletop time. I'm, I'm, I'm Murray. Dave. <laughs> I, I'm Dave. Didn't expect no. you to go in first. It was I good. won. So today we're doing an awesome video uh, where we are making a sweet diorama. So we're gonna make, I'm kind of picturing it like an ant farm, a little ant farm, where we're gonna have a isometric view at a slice of a world. And that world is gonna be a little slice of Broken Anvil Manager's new game, Rivenstone. That sounds awesome. I'm pumped to do like a combat-y diorama. It's gonna be really cool. So yeah. let, let's just, let's just do it. All right. So the first thing I needed to do to get started was to cut out some foam. And we have a hot wire foam factory, which is a kit that basically has a few different tools. And I wanted to try out the sort of table cutter. Now I did find that this was not nearly as stable as I'd hoped, but after a few attempts and some trimming, I managed to get two pieces chock up against each other and close enough to a 90 degree angle. hold up our box, we needed a bit of rigidity, so we used some MDF sheets and cut it up using a jigsaw. That helped us further refine our 90 degree angles and set squares. With this in place, we could then glue the foam in, leaving one side open for us to access for some future LED work that we were planning on doing. Now that we had everything more or less in place, Dave got to work with the hot wire cutter to cut away at the tunnels. Two areas that were really important to me was making sure we had a tunnel that cut through the corner, allowing you to see through the square of the diorama and really add some depth, and also a tunnel that was leading up to where our iron guard drill would be breaching the surface. All right, so the core elements of this diorama are going to be models from our awesome sponsor today, which is the new game Rivenstone, which is coming out from the creators of Broken Anvil Miniatures. And I'm super pumped to have a look at what they've sent us. These are early promo models of the upcoming game, so I'm super excited to get to be one of the first people to look at them outside of their studios. All right, we, oh, look immediately. I'm very excited. I love Broken Anvil. I've been a patron for ages and it's fun. It's fun. It's fun getting open toys that no one else has. There's five factions to the game. I got a little sticker for each of the factions. That's super cute. Oh yeah. Yeah, look at this. This is like a revolver musket with a shield on it. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Now while most of the minis I have today are 3D printed prototypes, the actual completed models will be produced in CO cast heart, which is a material that holds super crisp detail and produces very durable minis. These are some awesome designs that are really approachable to new painters, as well as offering plenty of surfaces to try advanced techniques for those who are more experienced. What is an iron dredge boss? And why do I love it? Oh, it's got coal, I never realized. It's got like coal in its mouth. Hell yeah! Get him, boy! The team at Broken Anvil are creating not just a game, but an entire world that you can dive into with all kinds of cool lore and fiction based around their factions and long-term support going forward. The game itself will be an alternating activation skirmish style war game with rules that are easy to understand and learn, but with plenty of depth for those who are into that sort of thing. The Shattered Empire is one of the factions from the game and it's the one I am super keen on the most out of anything. They have a real like Final Fantasy uh, Magitech fantasy gunblade vibe going on. And as a longtime fan of Final Fantasy, I have to say, I'm very keen on that. Now, if all this sounds interesting, please check out their Kickstarter campaign, which starts on April 26th and will be running until May 26th. Thanks once again to Broken Anvil Miniatures. I'm super grateful to have been able to explore this product prior to release. I feel quite lucky. It's very cool and I'm excited to see how it comes along. Now, when we were initially plotting out this diorama, we assumed that the Iron Guard drill was just like a small object that bore through and would create tunnels. Like a capsule or a portal loop. But upon talking to the team at Broken Anvil Miniatures, we found out that that drill is called the Breach Head and it's actually part of a massive underground drill barge. And what they do is the Iron Guard travel in these massive underground drill barges. And then whenever they need to breach the surface, they poke almost like creating an elevator shaft, this breach head up to the surface and then their forces can travel through it with ease. Yeah, so it creates a giant pylon with the drill bit at the surface. And that meant with our exposed tunnel underneath the drill, Murray had some scratch building to do. I cut away enough of the cave space to give the illusion of a huge piece of machinery that was going right down into the center of the earth here. And then custom built a small amount of the machinery that would fit into place.
While Murray was filling out the breach head and the underground transportation tube, I was setting about creating some mining supports. People in mines typically don't like being crushed by rocks, so they will often use pillars and supports to hold up the roof. Balsa wood is amazing for this as it's super easy to quickly create a lot of texture and rough up the wood and make it feel really natural. I imagine that underground and with a lot of wear, these wood pieces would be what you can find rather than perfectly cut and manufactured. So the rough and ready look really works for them. In areas where mining has taken place and revealed a bunch of loose rocks, often a steel screen or meshing is used to stop any erosion or landslides or rock falls. I broke up a whole lot of small patches of foam and glued them onto the walls. This way, wherever the mesh covered, it was clear that there was a bunch of loose and large looking rocks that it was holding back. For the mesh itself, I used some modeling mesh, which is actually a product that you can use for scale modeling. There was a whole bunch of different sizes and I just chose the one that was most appropriate. To fasten the mesh into the walls, I used small nails. These small nails function really well as giant iron stakes that I imagine the iron guard bolting into the walls to keep these meshes in place. Another thing I added was a ladder that I created with balsa wood and matchsticks. And in areas of the ladder, I also bent some brass rod around, making it look like these horseshoe shaped pieces of metal that were also riveted or bolted into the walls to allow for the ladder to stay put underground, even if there's some seismic activity. Once I'd built the submerged part of the drill barge limb, I got to work with sculptor mold, making a nice textured surface for the dirt on top, and then adding even more to show that the breach head was bursting out of the ground, throwing everything aside. Side. For the small aqua, I came up with the idea of using hot glue to make the stalactites. I tried building them up on some baking paper and then turning it upside down so they all drip naturally. This created some really cool effects. Murray! It's us. It's Dave and Murray. It's the Dave and Murray show. It we is. thought we'd show you all where we're up to with words. So this is- These uh, aren't words, this is visuals. But we, we're using both, Murray. Both. What are you doing, Murray? What are you working on? I am getting some colors down so we can start painting the figures. That's more or less the centerpiece of our lovely diorama. Well, speaking of our lovely diorama, I feel like this is a really good point to start getting some paint on. Uh, we do want to add textures and details to the outside, of course, but before we do that, I really want to get in and airbrush all this underground business. I'm super happy with how it's looking so far. Let's get some uh, airbrushing happening and start to see this come together. For our two factions, we will be going off the official artwork for the inspiration for the color schemes. That means a lot of dark metals for the dwarves and the humans have a white, almost lacquered colored steel for their armor, which is then trimmed with a very fancy black steel. the various cloths and leathers, I decided to use a wet blend technique. So I started with a single color for each area, then mixed in some dark charcoal to create some shading. And I put that straight into the already wet paint on the models. This gave a very quick blended effect. Then I re-established the base tones where anything spilled over and then added some bone to highlight everything. While I wasn't vocal in it, I had secretly grown really attached to this diorama and I kind of wanted to paint it all myself. <laughs> I was being a bit greedy, but I subconsciously realized I had a vision for this project. And that vision takes me back to the Victorian Australian institution known as Sovereign Hill, which is kind of like a gold rush town with cosplayers and it's a whole thing. You go and learn about the gold rush and there you make candles and horseshoes and pan for gold. Anyway, they have these really cool cross section dioramas in their museum of how the mine shafts used to look. And I've always been fascinated by them. So this was my attempt at sort of creating a fantasy version of that. In the shafts themselves, I focused on reds and tans, airbrushing darker colors into the recesses and running streaks along the surfaces, creating lines or strata in the rocks where there were lots of colors defining the different layers of the earth. 
With the airbrush still in hand, it was a good opportunity for me to paint the Rivenstone deposits. I grabbed a fluoro pink paint and began airbrushing. Now, not only was this paint quite a nice and vibrant pink, but it also shines under UV light. So when we take our nighttime reveals with LEDs, we can have a few more spots of really vibrant visual interest. To give depth and detail to the insides of the caves, I dry brushed in patches using a few different greys to build up different areas of texture. I made sure not to dry brush all over, focusing on specific areas to give a different weathered and warm look to different areas of the caves. The combination of dry brushing and airbrushing and the natural texture that the foam cutter had created, I think lends a really organic and natural look to these caves. Now the iron grates had picked up a lot of the browns and colors from my airbrushing the cave walls. I'd loved how Murray had come up with painting the metal elements on our D&D tile build. So I copied that technique, highlighting in patchy areas using gray and then spot highlighting in fewer areas with a brighter gray. And then on the wood, I focused two different colored dry brushes, a more heavy all out with a khaki and then a more controlled orangey brown in certain areas to give a little bit of depth as if there was some wood grain and a little bit of visual texture. It is our mid project update and Murray is being pulled away to do other stuff. So we're getting a Jen, we got Jen and she's gonna work on our, she's working on our dwarves. Yeah. So Jen's gonna be painting our dwarves. You're working on the big boy now. Yeah. That's exciting. I can't wait to see how they're coming up. But that's where we're at. Uh, we're rallying. We're we're like tag out. Make some vavuzela horns. Burp, 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 burp. Tag out cooked Murray, who is <laughs> absolutely yeah okay. And uh, and it's exciting. We got a Jen. Yay! We bought a zoo. Yo, okay, it's my turn, woo. Now, I had a couple of choices, but Dave pretty much gave me no option but to go for the dwarves. And you know what? I was happy with that. These guys are so cool, and I thought that they're wearing a lot of metal, so unfortunately, I was gonna have to try and do a lot of non-metallic metal. Luckily, Mari had sprayed all of the models in his patent style with the different kinds of red, blue, and green. So this gave me a beautiful modeled effect that I could put paint on top of. We have a previous video here on Tabletop Time of how Jazza has done his non-metallic metal style. I followed his tutorial pretty well on point, but I came up with some of my own artistic liberties. I kind of went with a more messy and painterly style, just putting in the highlights where I felt like they needed to be. These guys were going to be underground as well, so I really wanted to keep in with the theme. They couldn't be too bright, too shiny, but needed that pop of colour. Once I was happy with the non-metallic metal, I moved on to just painting them all in. The dwarves, I gave them all orange beards because it's stereotypical and I felt like they just needed to have orange beards. With my models all done, it was time to hand them over for Dave so he could put them on the final piece. Inside the underground aquifer, I quickly smashed in some turquoise where the water would be, added some gamers grass, laser cut plants, and then used UV resin to fill it out. The underground section was almost finished, but I knew there was one thing I wanted to just give it that finishing touch, and that was lights. So I ran this pre-set up, cheap battery packed light set through the terrain, gluing on the LEDs to the wood beams where I would be hiding them a bit later. I cut out an even smaller grade of the mesh that I'd used previously for the rock slides and created little cages to go over the lights, making it look like they were protected lanterns attached to the walls. I hope in the world of Rivenstone there is some kind of magic electricity or steam power or something like that because, at least in my diorama, that's how the Iron Guard are lighting this place up. I painted the breach head in a similar technique to the rest of the metal, but then I absolutely buried it with weathering pigments. I used three different weathering pigments of a earthy brown all the way to an orange and built them up in different areas. I wanted to create the look that this had just burst through the earth. In fact, it doesn't get cleaned ever. I really like the dry dusty effect that weathering pigments leave and I think this has left an awesome effect. For the rest of the surface, I used Mod Podge to connect some Woodland Scenics turf and dirt. And then once that is dried, I carefully applied static grass to different areas of the surface in differing concentrations to give a natural variance to the grass.
After this was done, I added some Gamers Grass flowers for interest. And then at the end of second day working on this, I slathered the top portion with crackling paints, hoping that small amounts of it would crack and make the top section look even more like topsoil. And at this stage, all that was left to do was glue in our sweet miniatures. I hope you enjoy our Rivenstone diorama. In the world of Rivenstone, the Shattered Empire stumble upon a rare Rivenstone deposit on the surface of a fertile field. Unbeknownst to them, deep beneath the earth, the Iron Guard, masters of mining, and the ones with the self-appointed sole rights to all Rivenstone deposits are already hard at work digging up this vein. As the Iron Guard exploit the deposits beneath the earth, they follow this up towards the surface. Surprised by the sudden appearance of the Iron Guard, Shattered Empire scouts draw weapons with neither side willing to budge. Conflict is inevitable. But it is not only Iron Guard Dwarves that were leaving the Breach Head. It was also 6474 Got This, one of our latest patrons. Alongside Chad Tucker, Michelle Capone, Darcy Johns, JC Ruthane, Jesta Ria, and Leynad Neslo. Seeing such patronage overflowing with support, the Shattered Empire activated their Rivenstone Aperture Portal, and from within their own reinforcements, patrons Prime Aesthetic, Freya Elakir, Tyrus, Sawyer Clifton, and Malcolm Crow. And thank you to our patrons for not only reinforcing the Iron Guard and the Shattered Empire, but also reinforcing tabletop time, allowing us to make ever more ambitious videos like this one. Ta-da! Well, you've it's done. You've already seen it. You just saw the reveals. I'm really happy with it. This this was definitely an example of us being able to kind of stretch and do something really interesting and different. So um, it was a really fun project to work on. Hey, if you like these kind of projects, what, what should they do? I'm pretty sure that they should subscribe and leak this video to their friends so they can also leak it further. <laughs> leak it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Leak. Um, yeah. Good.